Ten years ago, my wife Corey and I, we had three kids. Our oldest son Brandon was four, Brian was two, uh, our daughter Morgan was eight months, and Evan was not even on the map, he wasn't even a thought in our heads. Today we are a family of six, um, 11 if you include all the pets, but our, our son Brandon is now a freshman in high school, he's 14, Brian is in seventh grade, he's 12, Morgan is 10 and she's going into fifth grade, and Evan is now on the map, he exists, we love him, wouldn't have it any other way, and, and he's in fourth grade. For our family, a, a plan has been very important, uh, especially for a guy like me who doesn't plan meticulously. If I don't have a picture and a vision of what could be or what will be, um, it'll be very easy for me to just go off the wayside and not plan toward anything. So for us, it's been very important. Yeah, let's give it up for Matt. Shout out to the good folk out in Apple Valley. Uh, always a delight to say good morning to you here in VV, but Apple Valley, being able to hear from their lead pastor today, what a blessing the Colombs are and have been to our church family for a long time. I also want to say hello to Phelan and Hesperia, uh, and thank you all for joining us uh, this part of the service each weekend. Uh, I'm always a little bit uh, uptight when I get up here. You are a, a very uh, intimidating group. The problem is today I'm terrified because for the first time in 20 years I can actually see the audience. So. So I know you guys in the first three rows, but I'm Tom Mercer. It's a pleasure to meet the rest of you. <laughs> actually, we've had our own little thing going for a number of years, but you guys are, uh, are actually in the house. Uh, if you need a copy of the outline, raise your hand and we'll provide that for you. We're going to continue our series, Future Family. And the idea is, uh, with this series, the idea is that there would be something we could do uh, to frame uh, the future of our homes, our families, our immediate families. And we believe that the Bible uh, describes an underlying principle that regulates virtually everything in God's universe, rather, whether it's the cosmic universe or the relational universe. And the idea is cause and effect, that for every effect that we have to either endure or enjoy, there has been a cause or a series of causes. What we do today with our families will be eventually the explanation for how things turn out. And we can dream about what we'd like our families to look like in five, 10, or 20 years, or we can strategize. And the Bible says that dreams are wonderful, but strategies work better than dreams. And so that is our plan to make a plan. Uh, we're developing a family covenant, a future family covenant each weekend a new paragraph, we're adding to that thing. We're going to give you some options when our series is over to uh, actually have that covenant uh, in a displayable format so that you can refer to it often through the years about what promises you made to God and uh, on the basis of your faithfulness, see what God does in response to that. Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verse 28, happy, 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 blessed, that's what the word means. It means happy, it means fortunate, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. There you guys have more cause and effect. The effect is that we would be happy, that we would look back on our lives and recognize that God has been faithful and that he has not only taken care of us in the midst of the storms of life, but there will be a sense of satisfaction that as difficult as it might have been, it has truly been a great ride. That is our goal. Um, the cause of that effect is that we would hear the word of God and obey it. Last time we, we talked about uh, communicating values and through communicating values we can raise the esteem of our families. Well. This time, we're going to talk about redeeming failure. And by redeeming failure, we can develop resilience in our homes so that when we are knocked down, we will get back up. And that we will uh, find 
uh, the difficult times to be exactly what they are, but we will also discover that God's grace is sufficient for everything he asks us to do. And some of you have become poster children for that reality because you've had some tough times. In fact, even coming to church for a family series becomes problematic because it opens old wounds and recreates those doubts that you tried to bury in recent months and years. And I just want you to hang in there because Jesus was right about everything. And you will be blessed through your faithfulness. As we talk about developing resilience by hearing and obeying the word of God, we do redeem failure. And in redeeming failure, we are blessed. It is not just those who are forgiven. It is those who are forgiving that become the greatest recipients of God's joy and blessing. We sent you out of here last weekend with some blanks that were not filled in, causing great regret and frustration. Now, some of you laughed at me when I mentioned this, but straight out of the American Psychiatric Journal, <laughs> empty blank disorder by definition, a psychological condition arising in response to the trauma of exiting a worship service without message notes completely filled in. EBD becomes acute when the message presenter ignores the circumstance without comment. Some patients find help by issuing a larger than typical tithe check to the church responsible for the trauma. You thought I was kidding. Right there. And anyway, you'll see at the top of your notes that's not necessarily true. Really? The American Psychiatric Association? No. Not really, but uh, let's go back. We're talking about what we wear, the kinds of things that we wear every day. We always ask questions, go into the closet, ask questions. What exactly am I doing today? What's the weather like today? Um, even our identity, our personal identity, who am I? Those questions are answered, and in answering them, we determine what it is we want to put on. Well, the Apostle Paul tells us in verse 12 of Colossians 3, which once again is our flagship section of Scripture for this series. In verse 12, he says, you need to clothe yourselves. If you truly want to raise esteem, if you want to communicate value to the people around you, you have to adorn yourselves with the right kinds of spiritual uh, dress. And so the last question we ask in our spiritual closet as we go in to see what we're going to wear today is we ask this question, how can I convince them that they belong? Now, once again, remember the context last weekend was all about communicating value. We talked about developing competence, talked about helping them feel accepted, and now feeling a sense of belonging. Those three things add up to communicating value to our families, our spouse and our children, our grandchildren, and that in turn uh, raises the esteem level of each one in our homes. So the words, the articles of clothing that Paul told us to put on are gentleness and patience. Now gentleness, protest in the Greek, it, it means to control your power. It has nothing to do with weakness. Sometimes we think of gentle people as not being very strong people. Jesus was very gentle, but he was very strong. We would agree on both sides of that reality. And the fact that you are gentle does not mean that you are weak. It means that you're very strong, but you control that strength. You are self-controlled. And then patience. Macrothumian is the Greek word. It means refusing to be upset by difficult people. It literally means long angered, which means it takes a long time before you get mad. Now some of you have that, that trigger that is so quick and your anger rises so quickly and that is a problem. It's hard to convince people that they belong in your life when you're always mad at them. And what Paul says is you have to just refuse to get angry, to be made upset. you got to be self-controlled. That's why gentleness and patience, proud taste and macrothumian go together. 
Now, with all of these ideas, these points that we're bringing out of Colossians chapter 3, we're giving you what we call dynamic principles. And here's a dynamic principle for you to consider. We hope it is very practical. And here we go when it comes to gentleness and patience. Only fight the battles you have to win. There are some battles you have to win in relationships. Figure out what they are and fight them. But let's face it. We'd like to get our way all the time, right? Which means there's a whole lot of battles we could fight. There are more battles to fight than you have days to live. And you just can't fight them all. You can't fight every battle. You can fight many battles. But you only have the emotional energy to win the most important battles. I remember early in our marriage, Cheryl looked at me one time in a conversation (laughs) and she said you always think you're right I said baby come on if I thought I was wrong I changed my mind (laughs) so I could think I was right again everybody always thinks they're right there's no crime in thinking you're right and if you ever discover that you're not my advice to you would be change your mind so that you can feel as if you're right that is a whole different conversation The conversation today is what are you going to do with that attitude that you think is right? That opinion that you think is right. Are you going to go to war every time for it? Well, the text is very clear. You, you You have to be gentle, which means you're just not going to go to battle all the time. You have to be patient, which means you're just going to have to put up with the fact that other people are going to be different than you, even at times not as correct as you. When you choose to fight too many battles, you, you, you exhaust yourself. You don't have the emotional energy to fight every battle. And then the important battles come up, and you're so extinguished emotionally, you have nothing to offer that situation. I don't know if you have ever been in a situation where um, something began to brew in a conversation or in some uh, particular setting and there's something that's real important to deal with and you just don't have the emotional strength to deal with it. You just throw up your hands and you walk away. You say, I just can't deal with it right now. Has that ever happened to you? Okay, let me tell you the number one reason why that happens to us. Because we spent all our emotional fuel on things that didn't matter. And now we can't bring that ordinance to bear at times when we need it the most. Many of you are just not selective enough in terms of the the battles that you want to engage. So anyway, don't do that, okay? Okay, that brings us to verse 13. (laughs) Verse 13, this flows. Now the reason why it was somewhat easy for us to just break last week with gentleness and patience is because the last part of 12 just flows right into 13. As you would expect, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. If you want to develop a family that is resilient and that bounces back, you have to learn how to redeem failure. And that's the subject, not only today, but also next time. Now, we're going to look at the first part of this verse today, and then we're saving the last part for next time. And it's not like half and half. The first part of the verse is the first four words. That's all you're going to get out of me today. Bear with each other. See, that's why proud taste and macrothumian are so important. That's why you need to be gentle and patient. Because one of the keys to redeeming failure is to learn how to bear. Learn how to bear. Aneko in the Greek means to endure. How are you going to endure if you're not gentle and patient? You're not. When do you need to read that statement, bear with each other? When do you need to bear? This is not a trick question. It is not profound. It is not deep. It is not, as we often say, rocket science. When do you need to bear? When people are unbearable, right? Now, how many of you live with someone who's unbearable? Okay, I didn't think many would raise their hand. The rest of you take your own lives into your hands when you raise your hand in answer to my questions in this series, and that's all fine. How many of you are unbearable? Oh, that's better. Everybody should have raised their hand both times, if we were honest. 
Because it's not a matter of some people are bearable and some people are unbearable. The reality is we're all unbearable at times. It's like we told you a couple weekends ago. We're not looking for perfection. In this case, I'm not trying to make you completely bearable. I'm just trying to minimize your unbearability factor. Because we all deal with this in our lives. You know, there are times, there are seasons when it's just so hard to put up with others in our home. And, and there's tension. Look what Paul said to the Romans. Romans chapter 7, verse 21. I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Can you relate to this? I really want to do. You know, Tom, you've been talking about this stuff. I know it's in the Bible. I know like I'm obligated. I know I feel like compelled but I got this problem because every time you open your mouth up there on the stage and my spirit says, yeah, I want to be that guy, I go home and then something happens and I'm not that guy. I'm not that gal. I make a commitment. I stand up at the end of the service and the whole church is there and I'm looking around and thinking, yeah, okay, let's recite this covenant. And I say this covenant, we walk out in the parking lot and I break covenant. Although I want to do good, Tom, evil is right there with me in my inner being. See, evil is right there with me. That is not a description of your husband in the driver's seat. <laughs> evil is right there with me. I can look over and see him. I just got a quick glance over to my left. It's in myself. In my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, not in him, not in her, not in them. It's going on in me, waging war against the law of my mind, what I know I need to do. And I feel like I'm a prisoner. Am I ever going to break out of this? Am I ever going to become the person I know God wants me to become? I know, I know, I got the Holy Spirit inside of me. My body's a temple of God and all that stuff. I know. Paul's lamenting about his own sin. I'm thinking Paul's an apostle. I'm just a dude, man. How, if the apostle Paul writes this, what kind of chance y'all have? <laughs> And then we call the people in our family to follow Christ and, and we're challenged, you know, to bear with them, bear with them, bear with them. Come on, you guys, what's the matter with you guys? And now we, we not only feel like failures, now we feel guilty because we can't do for them what they need. Well, next weekend, we're going to discuss how a redemptive family responds to failure, but this time I want to help you prepare for that. I want to help you prepare to bear, okay? See, some of you read the last part of verse 13, and you say, I know I need to forgive Tom. I just can't get there yet. And one of the reasons you can't get there is because you weren't ready. One of the reasons you don't redeem failure is because you weren't prepared for failure. So I want to help you prepare. That's what the idea of Ninko, that's what the idea of bearing is. It actually may be that preparing to redeem failure is as transformational as actually taking the step to do so. And so we're going to set you up, hopefully, for success. Just don't get too exhausted. Don't give up. Whatever you do, don't give up. Paul said when he wrote the Galatians, don't get tired. At the proper time, you'll reap a harvest. At the proper time, you'll reap a harvest. You will be blessed if you what? If you don't give up. Hear the word of God and obey it. Keep pushing that flywheel. Keep pressing forward. James put it this way, and this is so good. We talk about uh, gentleness and patience. Look what James said. James 1.4. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. <laughs> perseverance works on you. It works on you. It's not just something that that you develop over time. It's actually like getting out the toolbox and it's like hammering you, you know? It's got the wrench and it's squeezing you. It's working on you. Let perseverance finish its work. See, sometimes we feel like we just endure. You know, we bear and we think there's some eternal reward in that and there's gonna be another jewel in your crown, so just hang in there. 
When in reality, perseverance can change the trajectory of your future if you just let it finish what it began in you. And, and James' challenge is to let it do what only it can do. And, and I would say that what perseverance does is it changes our expectations. Expectations need to be realistic. In fact, last time we had a principle that I told you to write down. I don't know if you did. Um, but I, I thought it was brilliant. Rules without relationship always leads to rebellion. We find it really easy to lay down the law at home but we don't develop the relationships at home that actually provide the greatest chance for success. And if you lay down the rules, but you don't develop the relationship, you're going to experience rebellion. Well, here's another one. In fact, it's the only principle really or point that, that we have. And then we've got some dynamic ideas, dynamic principles, what you follow up on. But here's the main umbrella for today. Relationship without realism always leads to regret. Relationship without realism always leads to regret. I want to prepare you to bear. And you just have to have realistic expectations. Okay, here we go. Let me give you some ideas regarding the expectations that you should have in your family, in any relationship. Perseverance is just what you need to know up front. See, we keep telling you that even if you're single, you figure this out now, this will serve you well when you're married. Some of you coming out of a very difficult season and you don't know when you're gonna re-engage either marriage, you're gonna re-engage those relationships that were broken, but I will tell you, if you get there, it will be because your expectations have shifted. Perseverance is never needed at the beginning of an assignment. <laughs> I know my job is to overstate the obvious. But you don't need perseverance at the beginning. That's why when you start to date, your life is just different than it is now. You know, you're thinking, even the person you love, you're sitting there and you're thinking, man, it's different now than it was when we started dating. Because when you started dating, you weren't loving, you were limmering. You say, well, what's the difference? Limerence is not love. This is a word that describes the romantic feelings that we have at the beginning of a relationship before perseverance is even needed. This is when you're in school and you grab her hand or you grab his hand and your, your palms start to sweat and your blood rate increases. This is what happens at night when you're lying there and you can't think of anything but him or her. This is when you're just romanticizing about the wonderful life that you're gonna have in the future. You know what that is? It's not love. You say, I'm in, I'm in love. No, you're in limerence. It's a different word. M. Scott Peck, he describes limerence this way. We cannot take any credit for the kind of generous things we do while under the influence of limerence. Ladies, you're thinking, back in the day when my husband and I were limering, he was so nice to me. <laughs> and what does this guy say? Don't even give him credit then. He was pushed and carried along by an instinctual force that went beyond normal behavior patterns. Our reasoning abilities are disengaged. We find ourselves doing and saying things we would never have done in more sober moments. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> and you're thinking, well, where did that go? Oh, wouldn't it be nice if those feelings just lasted forever? No, that would be, we would live in a chaotic world if everybody continued to limmer for the rest of their lives. Because when you're in limerence, you take a temporary leave of absence from the real world. You don't think of anything else. You don't even want to go to work. You might call in sick at work. I just can't go to work. Why not? Oh, you say, uh, I just can't, I can't think of work right now, man, because I'm just, I'm thinking of her. I'm thinking of him. You don't tell your boss that, but that's what's going on. <laughs> can't do your homework in school. You lose your appetite. You can't even eat because that limmering feeling actually is causing you nausea. And then the real world returns as it inevitably must, and you're shocked and you're disappointed. Where did it go? But if it didn't go away, you couldn't get back to the real world. You'd lose your job. You'd flunk out of school. Limerence is not even an act of the will. It requires no discipline. It happens. Limerence happens. You know what takes discipline? Love. So don't go looking for a new romantic rush every couple of years, and that's the, that's the time frame. Limerence usually lasts no more than 24 months. 
Some of you are into your third year of marriage and you're thinking, oh man, we lost the feeling. Remember all those songs you used to sing when you're driving along, cruising along when you were a kid? Oh man, I've lost the feeling. Now we got to break up because I lost the feeling. <laughs> okay, go find somebody else to limmer with for a couple of years. You're going to lose that feeling too. That's the point. Don't keep looking for limerence. Persevere. And when you persevere, what happens? You develop the opportunity because now the stage is different. Now we go to scene two. Now we go to act two. Now it's the opportunity for you to show love in a disciplined way like Jesus did. He wasn't hanging on the cross saying, oh man, where'd the feeling go? Man, we had such a good thing going. I don't know what happened. That's why he came. It took great discipline. It took great focus. It took endurance. You got to let perseverance finish its work. Don't give up because you lose the feeling. Barry Manilow was wrong, man. It was just wrong. Okay, here's another one. Nobody finds a soulmate, okay? I'm just trying to set the table for you. Now, some of you who are single are looking for a soulmate. You will not find one. Some of you are lamenting the fact that your spouse is not a soulmate. Not yet they're not, because you don't find one. No one out there is perfect, unless by perfect. You say, I want to find Mr. Perfect. If you mean someone who's going to help you develop perseverance, that would be perfect, because God wants perseverance to do its work in you. And what provokes perseverance, the need for perseverance more, than living with what's his name? Garrison Keller, I love this quote. He said, the people who believe in the perfectibility of people only believe that about people they met last Tuesday. <laughs> but while you'll never meet a soulmate, let me just help you understand what I'm not saying. You, you won't ever find or meet a soulmate, but you can become one. You can become one if you what? If you bear, if you endure, if you persevere. I'm a better person than I was 36 years ago when I married Cheryl because she demanded that I change. She didn't demand in that many words. Well, come to think of it, actually she did <laughs> on, on a number of occasions, but, but just through building a life with her. I am a better man today. The fact that I persevered, that she persevered, we, we are now what? We are now blessed. Why? Because we found such beautiful synergy together. No. Oh, gosh. No. But we become, man, we, you know it. And some of you, you could give the same testimony that I give. There's that point where you find your groove. I used to drive a, a Camaro. It was a pretty fast car. And um, actually, it's while Cheryl and I were courting that I had my, my Z28 Camaro. And uh, it was a very lonely uh, two-lane road. Nobody ever traveled it when I would leave her house and drive to my apartment. And um, oftentimes late in the evening, and I'd just be cruising along 60, 70 miles an hour. I'm not proud of this, but I'm, I'm fessing up, okay? I was a young man, I was a foolish young man. And my car back, you know, in the late 70s, cars had a lot of equipment that hindered its efficiency until you got right about 90 and then it was like the car just breathed a sigh of relief and said thank you <laughs> thank you and I said you're welcome and we enjoyed <laughs> we enjoyed that that ride the rest of the way home now why do I tell you that because that's the way marriage is you know it's it's there's a lot of things that seem to come against us and those things never stop in the relational world, but then there's a point where you say to one another, I think we found what we were looking for. And now, when I leave you, most of the time Cheryl's here with, with me, but when I leave you, you know, we're empty nesters now. We don't have kids at home. Oh, man. <laughs> That's like a best thing ever happened. <laughs> and, and, and I leave you guys, and I'm going home to my baby. 
And it's just, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed because I, I know what the Bible says. And I didn't apply it perfectly. She'd be the last one to tell you I applied it perfectly. But I applied it in my awkward, imperfect way. And now, um, and now we have what we have. So anyway, persevere. Maybe you've even said, well, I should have never gotten married to that person. I, I, you know, people have told me I should never got married. I'm wondering, well, what is that supposed to mean? It means that many people hold the mistake in and may, may I say naive view that any relationship that God could lead us to in the future would be easier than the one we have. God would have been glad to send you a knight in shining armor. He just didn't have any. All he had were losers like us. <laughs> would you turn to the person, if you're here with your spouse, this can be a very special moment. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, God would have sent me somebody better than you, but you're the best, you're the best I could get. <laughs> just, just say that. You feel, are you feeling it today? Are you, <laughs> are you feeling it? Yeah, I knew you would be. All right. All right, another principle. Happiness is a gift, not a goal. Happiness is a gift, not a goal. Remember what Jesus said. Happy are those who hear the word of God and obey it. The goal is not to be happy. The goal is to hear the word of God and obey it. That's the goal. And what do you get when you do that? Happiness. Faithfulness is the goal. Happiness is the reward. See, people are looking for happiness. If you're looking for happiness in, in marriage, if you're looking for just happiness in relationships in your family, you will be disappointed because you cannot you know, find it. You can only receive it. See? That's why some of you are, are divorced a couple of times. I'm not being condescending. I'm certainly not being critical and judging people as way above my pay grade. I'm just simply analyzing why is it that second marriage divorce rates are so much higher than first? The last message in this series will be talking about surrounding ourselves by godly influences and we'll talk about that in regard to your children and how you balance your mission in an ungodly world with protecting your children from that ungodly world. But that also happens when it comes to adults because so often we hear about people who are struggling in their marriage and their relationship and then they go to their friends and they get advice. Sometimes, unfortunately, it's from Christian people. But if not from Christian people, certainly from the world, and they say, well, you deserve better than that. And I, I'm not here to analyze your specific situation because I don't even understand it. But can I just tell you what you deserve? You deserve to go straight to hell. Just like me. That's what we deserve. Any, I've always said this, man. Anything that includes not going to hell is like icing on the cake for me. Because of, because of what I deserve. And so what happens is, you know, you deserve to be happy. I'm, I'm not, we don't deserve to be happy. We deserve to be punished for our sin. And the beautiful thing about a relationship with God through Christ, some of you are really backpedaling right now saying, whoa. Let me help you understand this in, in theological terms. Jesus died because he loved you and he didn't want you to have to experience what you deserve. And Jesus wants to give you the gift of happiness. Something you can't find. Actually, that's why he came. Because none of us could find what he wanted us to have. So in coming, he gave it to us as a gift. Just out of love. The world says you'll find happiness if you just look long enough. God says... You'll receive happiness if you remain faithful. Remain faithful because that is the cause. Happiness is the effect, and we live in a cause and effect world. Okay, next point. Here we go. Passion is what it is. Passion is what it is. Now, I know that that line we use with everything, right? When you have nothing... Um, intelligent to say about 
an individual or an idea. You just, you just say, and you don't even have to be listening in in the conversation. You could be like watching a football game and you've got a conversation going over here and you miss like a paragraph, but then you look over and there's the look that says, you're listening to me, right? Not watching the game, right? And so you always respond with things like, yeah, it is what it is. It always works. It's like you're engaged. It's like you're listening. Now, I'm not trying to give you guys advice here. I'm just saying. When it comes to passion, though, it really is what it is. Passion is passion. And some people are just passionate people. We're talking about personality. We're talking about the way you're, you're built internally. Passion is what it is. St. Jerome, man, a smart guy. He says, he who is not arguing is not married. <laughs> See, if you don't have conflict, you know, people say, well, if we didn't have conflict, that'd be the sign of a healthy marriage. No, that'd be the sign that you are, you've been widowed, <laughs> actually. Uh, because the only people you don't argue with that you love are the ones who have died. I probably should have said that a little differently, but it's true. <laughs> if, you're, if you got a living, breathing person in your family that you love, you will have conflict. Premaritals, premaritals are always fun because they just smile. Oh, I just love, we just love each other. I say, well, how, tell me about your last fight. Sometimes is what they say. Oh, Pastor Tom, we don't fight. I say, seriously? And how long have you known each other? You know, we've known each other for months. Say, well, and you've never had an argument, never had an argument. Okay, well, let me tell you what to do. Put your engagement on hold and wait until you have a horrific argument. And then when you come back, we can talk about how you resolve that and how you can resolve that in a more healthy way. Because you guys, that's all you can do with conflict is resolve it in a healthy way because you're going to have conflict. Because if you don't have, if you don't argue, y'all aren't in relationship. And the, the more you love somebody, the more <laughs> you're going to have conflict. We'll have more to say about this in a future message on communication and conflict. I'm just saying passion is what it is. Now, why do I say that? Um, years ago, a, a gal, Cheryl and I were talking and with this gal. She said... Um, my husband is not a, he's such a dud. This is what she said. This is exactly what she said. He's such a dud. I said, a dud? She said, yeah. He's I said, I bet you don't argue that much. She goes, no, we don't argue that much. I said, see, that's the upside of marrying a dud. Because you don't argue much. Now, ladies, I will tell you this. Gentlemen, if you argue a lot, the upside to your arguing is that you married a passionate person. And there's something to be said for that. Don't extinguish the passion. You know, that's what people want. They, want. they want the best of both worlds. That when it comes to expressing love, they want passion. And then when it comes to resolving differences, they want a dud. They want somebody to just walk over, see? You don't get it both ways, see? You, you get what you get because passion is what it is. And I told you last time, same thing's true. I think I told you last time. Thing, same thing's true for raising kids. Men are designed a certain way in terms of the way God wired us. And this is a whole nother presentation we don't have time to get into. But see, men are designed to be cultivators. That is, we like to make things work. We like to make things faster. We, we look at a, you know, we, we look at a, uh, a speedometer. You buy a new car, you look at a speedometer. That's a personal challenge to you right? I mean, you drive this brand new car home and you're already thinking how you can put a chip in it to get about, you know, 60 more horsepower, like a, get headers. We got to get a new exhaust system. Nothing's ever done with a guy. There's always that idea of making it bigger and faster. You know, that's the way we are. God wired us to cultivate, to make things work. He wired us to fight. He wired us to be warriors. He wired us to be advisors, to provide wisdom for our families. That's how God designed us, cultivators, warriors. 
advisors, fight for what's right. Man, I could not describe my teenage son. He's 30 now, but 15 years ago, any better than that. He, he, always, he always wanted to tell me what to do. You ever raised a teenage son? He always wanted to fight with me. I'd walk away from conversation saying, dude wants to always fight with me. I'd go and tell Cheryl. i say, Cheryl, what's up with him? Always seems like he wants to fight for what he thinks is right. He always wants to give me advice. He always has better ideas about how what I do could be made better. And I walk away from those encounters discouraged because of the conflict instead of celebrating the fact that he's becoming what? A man. Someday I would listen to his advice. Not then, he didn't have any wisdom yet. He's an idiot. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, right now, it's not uncommon. Hey, bro, what do you think? What do you think? I'm thinking about something, just thought I'd get your take. Because he has become that. All guys do. You put two... That's why we have. That's why we celebrate empty nest. At some point, a couple of alpha males, one alpha male needs to go. <laughs> Ladies, same way. You got the same conflict with your daughters at home, right? You know, growing up and oh, go to your husband. I don't know what's going on with her. Two alpha females in the same pen. One of them has to go. As long as you make it clear that you're the parent, you ain't going anywhere. <laughs> That's a battle you have to win, right? I don't fight that bad boy. All right, anyway. Another principle, understanding Trump's agreement. Got to be brief. You know, in, in conversations, if your goal is agreement, well, let me just say, that's not wise because you're so different. Doesn't mean you're incompatible unless agreement trumps understanding in your world. You will discover how incompatible you are if agreement is your goal. Can't be your goal. Understanding must be your goal. And then that must be the goal you're satisfied with. And some of you, frankly, are not satisfied with understanding. Okay, I understand what you're saying, baby, but unless you agree with me, this fight's going to go on a while. Agreement is overrated. Why is the Bible so filled with ideas like submit, Bear with one another. Bear, bear with one another. Arr, bear. Why? Because you're not going to agree. That's why. And most of the time, it's not agreement that you achieve. It's exhaustion. Okay, okay, have it your way. I agree, I agree, right? It's not agreement. It's because it's a ridiculous goal. Give it up. It's okay. It's okay to not agree. In fact, the beautiful thing is that you can love while you disagree at the same time. You know what that is? That's a great relationship. And so that understanding kind of run, you know, the conversation. What do we, help me understand you, which means you got to shut up and start listening. Help me understand you. What is the number one concern that children have, teenage kids have about their parents. It's not that they don't agree with me. Kids never expect the parents to agree. Parents are, they're out there somewhere orbiting a planet I don't even know. But what do kids say? They don't understand me. And you know the truth is? You don't. Because you, you bring ideas like, well, when I was a kid, let me tell you how things were when I was a kid. <laughs> okay, I don't have time for this, but I got to tell you this. I was a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor in a former life. I don't believe in reincarnation until we talk about ministry. Then I became a senior pastor here. And then over time, our youth ministry began to grow. Now I'm talking to our student leaders. And they tell me what the young people today are dealing with. And I say, are you serious? I mean, that's what they're putting up with on their campuses? Like, 
Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. I, this is not something you should write down or, because there's no blanks here. That's a whole other disorder. This is something you should write down anyway. Never tell your kids you had a rough when you were their age. Because being a kid today, that's hard. And if you grew up 15, 20, 30 years ago, you don't understand that. So, and kids sitting there saying, oh, finally. <laughs> Let me tell you something about being a parent because that's never changed. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do if God gives you the opportunity to. And when you become a parent, you're going to look back with great fondness and affection because for the first time in your life, you'll, you'll feel what it was like for them. When all they wanted was for you to excel. Understanding is so much more important than agreement. Um, the, in Proverbs, Solomon says, by, by wisdom a house is built, and through what? Understanding it is established. Cause and effect. What's the effect? The house is built. What's the cause? You understand one another. Whoever is Next verse, whoever is, here we go, Macrothumian, whoever is patient has great understanding. See how this all dovetails together? And last, prepare for the inevitable. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to be real brief here. It is, what, how do I say this? How many of you are raising children, elementary age children? Raise your hand. Great. Let's just pray for you right now. Um, do you expect them to become teenagers? <laughs> Why aren't you preparing for that? See, there are a lot of things in life that happen, and we call them curveballs or, you know, that slider on the outside of the plate, change up, things that, oh man, it caught me off guard. Happens to all of us. We don't expect some things. But of all of the crises in your life, let's just say you listed the top 10 crises in your life. I'll bet you eight or nine out of 10, you could have prepared for and you chose not to. Infants become toddlers. Terrible twos, you've heard the terrible twos? Okay, you've got this sweet little baby, sweet little baby, it's gonna become a toddler. <laughs> Toddlers are gonna go to school and learn a whole lot of stuff you didn't teach them. Elementary age kids, gonna become teenagers. Start to develop alpha male, alpha female tendencies for no other reason than you're doing a good job as a parent, and it's gonna get rough. See, it's gonna get rough. Empty nest, it's gonna happen. There will be a day when all you got is him or her. And you can no longer vest all of your emotional capital into your children. And it's going to be them, him, her. You ready for that? See, some people, some families spend so much time raising kids, they forget the marriage. You know why that's dumb? Because you will spend more time without kids than you ever will with them. See, what am I saying? Preparing for the inevitable. I mean, we have family conferences. Why? To prepare you for these shocking things that could take place in your life? No. We have parenting conferences, family conferences to prepare you for what you and I would both agree. We know it's going to happen. Got to get ready. Minnesota Crime Commission. I love this. This, this, is, this is not a Christian organization. This is what they said about the child that you brought into the world. You ready? Every baby starts life as a little savage. Completely selfish and self-centered, wants what he wants when he wants it, his bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toy, his uncle's watch, deny him one of these, he seethes with rage and aggressiveness, which would be murderous were he not so helpless. 
He's dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, y'all children, are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in the self-centered world of his infancy, giving him free reign to his impulsive actions to satisfy his wants, every child would grow up a criminal, a thief, a killer, or a rapist, end of quote. Thank you for something we already know. If we've been parents, that's the way it is. Now let me just ask a question, preparing for the inevitable. Anybody here um, pregnant for the first time? Pastor Tom, full service pastor, just letting you in on what's going to happen. <laughs> and the thing is, then the kid starts growing up, and then you got elementary issues, you got teenage issues. What did you expect with these people? <laughs> it takes hard work to parent, it takes hard work, perseverance to bear. But if you are up for it, there is blessing waiting for you in the future. Let's stand together and let's quote this last or this newest, not last. We've got more of this covenant to go, but let's just quote this together and then we'll close in prayer. And by the way, we get to the last part of verse 13 next week. We'll be bringing this same paragraph back because this is one paragraph for the entire verse. We'll say this out loud together. If you mean it, say it. If there are parts of this you don't mean, just mumble. We covenant as a family to openly acknowledge our failures, yet only discuss them in the light of God's grace. Recognizing our need to regularly receive forgiveness, we commit to extend it generously and often. We will humbly seek reconciliation before we go to bed each night. Boy, that'd be a great thing if it actually, actually <laughs> happened. You say, spirit is willing. I don't know about the flesh, man, if we can do this. I'm telling you, you can. Come back next time. We'll finish verse 13. Father, we thank you just for such a great um, group uh, to uh, just go through life with, to talk to, talk with, to challenge and be challenged by. Our request is that you would help us to negotiate the very turbulent waters of our culture, especially in our homes as we seek to be lights in a very dark world. But he's head bowed and your eyes closed. We end all of our services this way. Sometimes it's not about the group. It's not about the family. It's just about you and what you bring to the formula. And without Christ, you have no spiritual life. You've been born physically but not spiritually. And even the things that we share today are impossible for you to achieve, even engage without Jesus Christ coming in and transforming you from the inside out. ABC, admit that you're a sinner. Can you do that? Believe that Jesus is the Savior God provided you, and I think even people who aren't Christians somehow know Jesus was and is the Savior of the world. But would you be willing to choose to put your faith in him? Whatever you have your faith in right now, you need to take your faith out of that person or that idea or that religion and place your faith in the hands of Jesus. He will save you eternally and he will walk you through the next week as you seek to become the individual and even the family God would love for you to be and experience the happiness that only he can give. And Father, we pray that there are those who need that that you would give them clarity, that they would make that choice. And for the rest of us, we look forward to good reports and growing even more next weekend as we continue this assault on this passage. Would your spirit give us clarity in Jesus' name, his great name, all God's children said. Amen. See you next time.